Jesus wasn't a Christian, just like Buddha wasn't a Buddhist. <laughs> uh, just like Muhammad wasn't a, a Mohammedan. Uh, all of these religions are based on an individual and their personal relationship with God. That's the real thing. So we want you to have the real thing, not some institutional reflection of the real thing, because that's unreal. It's just an abstraction. It's just words on paper. Huh? It's not real. But in our materially conditioned state, we're liable to accept it because we're used to being offered false promises. Oh, I love you forever. Please marry me. And nobody can love another human being forever. Sooner or later, something is going to happen that makes us fall out of love. So what's the real thing? Love God forever. Uh, because even if you change your mind about what you find beautiful or what you find attractive, guess what? Whatever it is, is still there in God. And he can reveal that part of himself to you in a second. So chant the holy name of God, Krishna, Hare Krishna, because within that name, there are all enjoyable qualities, all enjoyable things, all beautiful qualities. The more you chant, the more he will reveal himself to you, and you will actually get to experience his qualities directly, not through a book or a lecture or some other process or medium, but directly, personally, within your own heart. Once you've had one of these spiritual experiences, then you'll know what I'm talking about. Uh, it's not the same as going to church or learning some philosophy or even like meditation or yoga or any of that stuff. It's a real, real-time, direct personal relationship. So please take advantage of this process and you will find everything we're talking about is true. I haven't cheated you because I have nothing to gain by it. Huh? You simply follow this process and you will get a gain that's beyond anything that you can imagine. That's our promise. So we're almost out of tape. So anybody who has a question, please write it in the chat box and then we'll respond after we change the tape. After this break for station identification, KRSNA, the duality station. Okay, do we have any questions? Yes, Nevin has a question. Oh, good old Nevin. <laughs> Babaji, when we speak of God responding according to how we approach him, how accurate is it to say that every person's conception of God is a function of his or her consciousness? So some people will say that God is whatever you think he is, and there is some truth to that, because Krishna will respond in an impersonal way if we think of him as impersonal, right? But that is a relative view. There is an absolute conception of the soul, right? That's the question? That's the question. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Tony. <Tom> <laughs> well, you answered your own question. <laughs> People who want to think of God in a relative way, they they get the booby prize. They get religion, or they get element, or something else. There's a philosophy. It's even a Vedic philosophy by Jaimini. Jaimini is one of the disciples of. Pra Muni, and he was a contemporary of him. And Jaimini developed a Vedic philosophy, it's based on the Vedas, called Karma Mimamsha. And Karma Mimamsha basically says that God is obligated to give us the result of our fruitive activities. So when we perform Vedic sacrifices, fire, jagnya, and, and like that, that God has to give us the karmic result. He has to give us wealth and so on. Uh, basically four principles. Dharma, Artha, Kama, and Moksha, meaning religiosity, 
or uh, good karma for the future, uh, economic development, wealth, uh, kama means sense gratification, and moksha means ultimate liberation from material existence. However, if we read the Vedas deeply, we have two things happen. One, if we perform fruitive activities, and fruitive activities include Vedic sacrifices, such as Agnihotra and temple worship, and even chanting the holy name. Uh, if we perform these sacrifices for our own benefit, thinking, oh, I'll get so much advancement in life by doing this, then we get that advancement. We get Dharma, Artha, Kama, and Moksha, but we don't get actual devotion or love of God. Uh, but if we perform those same sacrifices with the motivation to please God so that we're released from this material existence and get to be with Him, then guess what? The result or the product of those sacrifices will be devotional service of God. You see, it's all in the motivation. It's all in the attitude. It's all in how we approach God. It's qualitative, not quantitative. So when we approach God uh, for some selfish purpose, we may get our purpose, but we don't get Him. We don't get the ultimate purpose of the Vedas or the ultimate purpose of the sacrifices given in the scriptures. We get some secondary purpose, some secondary result. Uh, I mean, these things are very nice, but they can be misused. For example, Ravana. Ravana, in many ways, was a great soul. He performed many Vedic sacrifices. He even defeated Lord Indra in combat. I mean, he had a lot of good qualities. He had a lot of powers, mostly granted by Lord Shiva. But even Lord Brahma gave him benedictions. Uh, so we can understand that he was performing these Vedic sacrifices, but not for the purpose of transcendental liberation, rather for the purpose of his own self-aggrandizement. Give me more power, give me more wealth, uh, like that. And he got those things, but he was ultimately defeated by Lord Rama, the Supreme Personality of Godhead himself. Why? Because all of his efforts and all his sacrifices work and all the, the stuff that he did, even though it was based on Vedic principles, at least to some degree, was for a selfish purpose, ultimately a demoniac purpose. He wanted to cheat the Supreme Personality of Godhead out of his wife, Lakshmi, the goddess of fortune. Uh, this is not a very wise thing to do. <laughs> <laughs> so even though he had so many qualifications from the point of view of pious activities and sense enjoyment and all this knowledge about the material world and so on. I mean, he even had Lord Indra's chariot that he stole you know, after conquering Lord Indra in battle. But he couldn't defeat Lord Rama. Nobody can defeat the Lord. Uh, why would anybody even want to try to defeat the Lord? It, it shows a serious uh, cognitive imbalance. Uh, so when someone uses the Vedic sacrifices, even uh, apparently devotional uh, activities like temple, worship and like that. If someone uses them for their purposes, oh, now I'll become a big devotee and I can enjoy like anything. I know devotees like this. They get the booby prize. They get their, they get to enjoy. Huh? They get all that um, you have to donate so much money to get liberation or something like that. It's not about the quantity. It's about the quality. He says, he does say, though, that when a man's consciousness is completely removed from personal sense gratification, uh, 
and he doesn't care anymore about the results of his activities, but offers them as a sacrifice, then he's automatically in the position of liberation, even though he may be existing within this material world. So apparently, a devotee is engaged in all the activities that everybody else is doing. Huh? We're eating, we're sleeping, we're getting up in the morning, we're doing work, huh? we're going here, going there, uh, doing stuff, you know, like we have this video camera, we have so many computers and keyboards and we're recording stuff and we're doing all kinds of stuff. So apparently, we're just like other people, right? But the difference is the motivation for all these activities is to please God. I mean, don't you think if we really wanted to, we could be in business and make